I'm sorry, but gross. Would you just show up to a place and sample rotten sky meat? I know it was the 19th century, but were they not worried about bacteria? Ugh. Welcome to A Popular History of Unpopular Things, where we love all things weird, gross, and bloody disgusting. My name is Kelly Beard, and strap in, y'all. It's gonna get real weird around here today. So what we try to do here on the podcast is go back in time to learn about some of the less popular things. In other episodes, we've looked into cannibalism for survival with the Donner Party. We have solved a maritime mystery with the ghost ship Mary Celeste. We even tried to find out whether there was any truth to the claims that Elizabeth Bathory, a Hungarian countess, bathed in the blood of virgins to stay young. I'm sure some of you out there already know about some of this stuff, but it's my hope that you learn something new with every episode, whether it be paradoxical undressing or fluid dynamics. Equally as important, though, is the historical context. In my former career as a teacher, I used to tell my AP students that if they didn't explain why, they were doing it wrong. Being able to explain the context of an event is almost as important as the event itself. What good is knowing about the American Civil War if you can't understand the context of slavery that surrounds it, right? You can't appreciate why the sinking of the Titanic was so, well, Titanic, if you don't understand how the Industrial Revolution changed people's lives. But sometimes, there will be smaller stories that I want to share. Things that don't necessarily take up 30 to 45 minutes. So instead, we'll pair two similar stories together, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at two different stories involving food that flooded a town. The Great Molasses Flood of 1919 and the Kentucky Meat Shower of 1876. And if those titles don't get you going, then nothing will. Let's start with the Great Molasses Flood. The incident in question happened on January 15th, 1919. It was 40 degrees Fahrenheit in Boston, a pretty mild winter day, and in the north end, a steel tank on the historic Commercial Street was groaning and creaking, but nobody paid it much attention. It had been there for years now, and it always creaked in the winter. The tank was placed next to the Charles River and some Atlantic ports, a site where Caribbean ships would come and offload millions of gallons of fresh molasses dumped straight into this tank. So molasses is a byproduct of making sugar. Sugarcane is boiled, filtered, crystallized, and then centrifuged before you get the stuff that you put in your tea or coffee. It's in that last process, centrifuging, that sugar crystals are separated from a dark syrup, which is essentially molasses. Molasses can be used to make alcohol, among other things. Manufacturers will mix the stuff with yeast to allow for fermentation, which can then be distilled to make either ethanol or methanol, depending on the desired end product. Ethanol is used to make drinkable alcohols, most notably rum, if we're talking about sugar and molasses here, while methanol is used for industrial-grade stuff. There is a difference. Methanol is toxic, and it will poison you, so don't drink it. But as I said in the intro, context is important. We need to understand how and why a tank of molasses popped up in Boston's North End. What a weird place for it to be, right? Why not near the sugarcane factories in the Caribbean? So what was happening in Boston around 1919 to explain why millions of gallons of molasses were shipped in year-round? Well, the biggest and most obvious event we can point to was World War I, which had only just ended a little more than two months before the incident. For those of you who don't know or forgot or weren't paying attention in U.S. history, World War I ended on November 11th, 1918. It's what we call Armistice Day. People tend to remember it by the numbers 11, 11, 11, because the treaty was signed at 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month. And shortly after, two and a half million gallons of molasses absolutely destroyed Boston's North End. And yes, they are connected. From 1915 to 1919, manufacturing had picked up tremendously because of World War I. And yeah, I know we didn't technically join until 1917, but we were still manufacturing weapons to prepare as early as 1915. Particularly in need was methanol, industrial-grade alcohol that was used to help manufacture bombs that were to be used in war. So because bomb manufacturing was on the rise, so was methanol production. Because molasses was a relatively inexpensive way of making methanol, it helps explain why it was brought to the U.S. Weapons manufacturing. 
Another big event in 1919 to consider was Prohibition. Literally the day after the molasses flood, Prohibition was ratified and became the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It was first proposed in 1917, though, so it had been on the radar for a while. And though it was ratified the day after the flood, people knew it was going to happen well before. So, in line with a good old American capitalist spirit, ethanol production was super high at this point. Companies wanted to make money off of selling alcohol, and people wanted to buy it before it was banned. Prohibition was going to end alcohol sales the following year in 1920, so molasses imports were on the rise. Both of these events help explain why there was so much molasses coming to the U.S., but why Boston? Well, the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Company, or USIA, was a big distiller in 1919. One of its subsidiaries was the Purity Distilling Company, based in Boston. For those of you who have never heard the term subsidiaries before, or were too afraid to ask, in this context it refers to a company that's controlled by a larger one. So, the Purity Distilling Company was the majority owned and controlled by the USIA, making it a subsidiary. So, the Purity Distilling Company owns the groaning, creaking metal tank on the Charles River. Connected to it was a pipeline that transferred the molasses to a distillery plant in Cambridge on the other side of the river. And it was making a ton of money because of this high demand for molasses, so several shipments came each year. The metal tank suffered structural damage with each shipment. It was 50 feet tall and 90 feet wide, meant to hold around 2.5 million gallons of molasses. But as later engineers discovered after the flood, the walls were way too thin. The tank was only 0.67 inches at the bottom, 0.31 inches thick at the top. That's right, less than an inch of metal was meant to hold 2.5 million gallons of molasses. That quantity of liquid sugar would weigh 12,000 tons, or 26.4 million pounds, in a janky metal container less than an inch thick. I mean, no wonder it burst, right? So the tank had only been filled 29 times over the four years it was there, and only four of those times was it filled to capacity. The day it collapsed was one of those four days. Two days before the disaster, a ship from Puerto Rico filled the tank to capacity, enough to fill three and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools. The tank creaked under the weight, amplified by another structural integrity problem, the metal rivets. To keep it short and simplified, rivets are mechanical fasteners. It looks like a metal mushroom. It's got a dome head and a cylindrical body. Old school rivets were heated, then placed into a drilled hole, and the cylindrical end hammered into place. There were also something called pop rivets, where a rivet could be inserted into the hole with a gun, which then pulls it back into place. I'm not sure which type they used on this tank, I couldn't find it in my research, but regardless, the rivets were shoddy and they leaked, molasses constantly oozing down the sides of the tank. In fact, this was so common a problem that the USIA painted the tank brown to hide the fact that so much molasses was spilling out. This, my friends, is being reactive instead of proactive. They were reacting to the molasses spilling out by painting the tank, instead of being proactive by solving the mechanical problem. To put it another way, they'd rather deal with the symptoms of the problem than fix the problem itself. Don't, don't do that. It's never good to be reactive instead of proactive. Solve the issue before it becomes a problem. So in the early afternoon on January 15th, the tank had had enough. It was filled to capacity with heavy molasses, but its structural integrity had worsened over the past four years of use. Some think that perhaps the molasses started to ferment inside, releasing carbon dioxide, increasing the pressure, and it's possible. But it's also likely that the poorly built tank was just overburdened. The rivets burst, slivers of steel exploding in all directions, and an absolute flood of molasses came out. A 15-foot-tall wall of sticky syrup, a hundred yards wide, came flying out of that tank at 35 miles an hour. It obliterated everything in its path. People, horses, buildings, electrical poles, and even the steel train platform supports, which were bent and torn apart. And I know it sounds crazy that molasses did all that, but it's true. Some people, including a handful of kids playing next to the tank, unfortunately, suffocated to death. There was nowhere to run. And it's a sticky, gloppy mass, so if it piled on top of you by 10 feet, there's no space to breathe in there. 
It's not like you swim to the surface of it. Molasses is 1.5 times heavier than water. Others were killed by the things thrown around by the force of it. A car struck and killed another kid nearby. Not the force of the tank breaking, by the way, but the force of the molasses flood pushing things around. Now, the molasses receded relatively quickly. It only spread out about two blocks in all directions from the tank, including into the nearby ocean. But by the time it was done, 21 people died. It left behind waist-deep muck that people were stuck in. Luckily, first responders came very quickly, including over 100 sailors from the nearby USS Nantucket. The 40-degree weather, although mild for a Boston winter, was enough to make the sludge harden, so it became hard to clean up and save people. The smell of molasses lingered in the North End for months, made worse when summer eventually rolled around. So how can molasses be so damaging? I mean, I know there was a lot of it, but how can a sticky mass be so forceful it can bend steel? Well, let's talk about fluid dynamics again. And remember, don't judge me too hard, I'm a historian, not a scientist. So as it turns out, molasses is a non-Newtonian fluid. These types of fluids don't follow Newton's laws of viscosity. Let's break this down. Viscosity is the thickness of a fluid. You know how water pours really easily, but maple syrup or honey kind of sludges out of the container? Well, that's because water has a low viscosity, while maple syrup and honey have high viscosity. The more viscous a fluid is, the thicker it is, and the slower it will flow. Water is not very viscous, and we can tell by looking at it when we pour it. But honey is very viscous because when we pour it, it's slow to come out. I won't get into the science of why certain fluids are more viscous than others. We don't need to know that for this podcast. But what we do need to consider is the force applied to the fluid. Long story short and simplified, Newtonian fluids will still act like fluids when force is applied. When force is applied to water, it flows faster, but it doesn't become more dense. Water is what we call a Newtonian fluid. Non-Newtonian fluids don't act the same way. When force is applied to a non-Newtonian fluid, it changes its viscosity. Here's a common non-Newtonian fluid for you. Ketchup. How weird, right? Ketchup's viscosity varies with the amount of pressure applied to it. To make ketchup more liquidy, or should I say less viscous, thinner, you just need to shake the bottle. The force applied to it this way changes the viscosity, making it lower, and it will flow better out the bottle. Molasses is also a non-Newtonian fluid. Not only does it change its viscosity based on force, but also based on temperature. The colder it is, the harder it will be. The warmer it is, the more flowy it will be. 40 degrees is relatively cold, which means that the molasses would be harder. In addition to that, the force applied to the molasses from the sheer amount of it in the tank meant that it was more viscous, thicker. So when the tank burst, it acted like an avalanche or a mudslide or a lava flow, right? Is that visual help? It oozed out from the source at speed until there was less force applied to it, so it became less viscous and was able to kind of flow out from there. Weird, right? So as it turns out, though, the USIA knew that there were problems with the tank. A nearby laborer once brought in a chunk of steel from it and put it on the manager's desk. And the response he got was something along the lines of, I don't know what you want me to do. The tank still stands. Victims of the flood filed a lawsuit against the USIA, and they were eventually found guilty of negligence. They had to pay what amounts to $8 million in today's money to the surviving families and victims of the flood. The USIA did try to counterclaim. They said the tank was sabotaged, blaming Italian anarchists for bombing the thing. Didn't work, though. They were found at fault due to poor planning and a lack of oversight that led to structural integrity failure. Italian anarchists with bombs. Well, more context is needed to understand where that one came from. So there was large-scale immigration of Italians to the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. With them came a rise in xenophobia, which is prejudice against people from other countries. This anti-immigrant backlash was unfortunately not new. It also happened to the Irish in the mid to late 19th century during the years of the potato famine. Or maybe in U.S. history class, you remember hearing about the Chinese Exclusion Act. President Chester A. Arthur, who's one of the more forgettable ones in the middle, signed it in 1882, prohibiting Chinese labor immigration for 10 years. This was an actual thing. 
It's always been a hallmark of our country that when we get a wave of immigrants from a particular place, it's met by a wave of xenophobia, as people fear what changes may come as a result. Italian xenophobia was strong in 1919. It didn't help that there were a few Italian anarchists around, like Luigi Galliani, but these were outliers amongst a population of people who just wanted to live the American dream and work hard in this country, like all of us. Sorry, I just needed to explain that so the whole Italian anarchist's comment made sense. See? Knowing the context was important here. We needed to know what was going on in history around this period of time to understand it. I will never stop making this point. Anyway... That was the Great Molasses Flood of 1919. So much of the stuff spilled over the North Ends that even the water in the marina was stained brown for a couple of months. It took a while to get it all cleaned up, but they did, and today it remains one of Boston's most enduring pieces of folklore. That and the tea party, but this one was cooler. Or should I say stickier? Let's take a short break before we visit our other story, the Kentucky Meat Shower. Take it away, Nedrick! It's March 3rd, 1876. It's a beautiful Friday morning in Olympia Springs, a small town in the northeast part of Kentucky. There's a slight chill to this early spring air, but it's shaping up to be a lovely day. Mrs. Crouch goes outside her house to make soap and notices something falling through the air. Snowflakes, she thought, as she kept to her work. After all, it snowed in early March before. But her husband, Alan Crouch, noticed from inside their cozy home that it wasn't a spring snow shower. It looked like beef raining from the sky. Chunks of what seemed to be fresh meat in varying sizes peppered the Crouch home. The next day, several locals came by the Crouch cabin to examine what must have sounded like a joke. Meat falling from the sky? I mean, come on. One guy noticed that the meat was hanging from the fence posts, laying about the lawn, covering their entire property with this rotten stench. Though it was fresh when it fell, heavy air quotes, it had spoiled and shriveled up overnight. Most of the hunks of meat measured two inches by two inches, so pretty small, but they were everywhere. Hey, do yourself a favor. Type meat rain into Google Images and enjoy what pops up. It's safe for work, I promise, but you'll get an idea of what this stuff looked like. So two other guys showed up to taste the meat. Yeah, you heard right. They wanted to taste this mysterious meaty gift from the sky to figure out what type of animal it came from. I'm sorry, but gross. Would you just show up to a place and sample rotten sky meat? I know it was the 19th century, but were they not worried about bacteria? Ugh. Anyway, they ate some and determined that it wasn't deer or lamb. Helpful. Thanks for that, guys. So they sent along some of these samples to a lab preserved in glycerin. Glycerin, other than that 90s song from Bush, is a super viscous sugary substance that occurs naturally in things like beer or honey or vinegar or wine. It's commonly used as a sweetener, and it's also found in a lot of things you'd buy from a drugstore. Heart meds, cough drops, toothpaste, makeup, lotions, all sorts of things. Sugars can help preserve food. It does two main things. First, it acts as a humectant, which means it helps preserve moisture levels. Second, it slows the growth of bacteria and other microbes that would change the chemical composition, like mold or yeast. Think about a jar of jam, for example. Jam has a ton of sugar in it to make it sweet, but it's also there to help prevent it from getting all moldy while it's still sealed. It's a pretty decent preservative. Oh, this reminds me. In the future, I've got an episode planned about how some societies used honey to preserve human bodies. Societies. Plural. That should be a fun episode. So because they lacked anything else at the time, the Crouches and some scientists preserved some of the sky meat and glycerin and sent it off to a man named Brandeis for testing. And after a few months, Brandeis determined that the mysterious sky meat was not meat at all. It was something called Nostoc. Nostoc is a type of cyanobacteria that forms in colonies, and surrounding it is a protective, gelatinous goop. 
Brandeis said that this particular type of bacterial colony, Nostoc cranium, was flesh-colored, which explains why it looks like meat. Oh god, and some dudes ate that stuff. See, I told you they should have been more concerned about bacteria. Now, people believed that Nostoc could float on the wind, and when it rained, the gelatinous goo would swell up, and the whole mess would just rain down from the sky. <laughs> people had all sorts of fun nicknames for it. Star Jelly, Witch's Butter, and Star Slubber. Those are ridiculous, but okay, it sorta of sounds like what happened over the Crouch's house, except that the weather was clear and it hadn't rained, so it doesn't make sense. It wasn't Nostoc. Strike one for Brandeis. Luckily, though, he sent some of his extra samples to other scientists. Histologists, specifically. A histologist prepares, examines, and tests samples. One thought the samples came from the lung tissue of a human baby or a horse. Big range there. Another histologist agreed, but was more vague in describing its origin, saying that the samples came from some kind of animal cartilage or lung tissue. More examination revealed that of seven samples, two were lung tissue, three were muscle tissue, and two were cartilage. But none of this explains how the animal flesh rained down from the sky. And I'd also like to remind you that two absolute randos ate this stuff a day after it magically appeared on top of the Crouch House. Later that year, a Dr. Kastenbein cracked the code. The meat shower was a group of vultures projectile vomiting over the house. You heard me right. Vultures. Projectile vomiting vultures. Kastenbein got his own sample and did some tests. He set it on fire and decided that it smelled like rotten lamb. I'm not sure how scientific that experiment was, but the whole situation is weird, so who knows what's going on anymore. He thinks that a group of vultures must have eaten a dead sheep nearby, and then when flying high over the crouch house, vomited out some cartilage, lung, and muscle tissue. And since it fell from height, it had a chance to spread out, resembling rain, when it finally hit the old crouch homestead. So there are two kind of vultures native to Kentucky in the eastern U.S. The more common is the turkey vulture, which has two-toned brown wings and a very distinct red head. You probably see them all the time if you're on my side of the country. The other is the black vulture, and as the name implies, its wings are almost all black, with a small fringe of white near the end of the wings, and it has a black head. You can find either, and sometimes both, feasting on carrion, which is the decaying flesh of dead animals. Vultures of both varieties are known to vomit. It's a method of self-defense. They can projectile vomit up to 10 feet to scare away any animals bothering them. It also helps them escape faster if they're in danger. A lighter belly means they can fly away faster. Oh, fun fact, by the way. The collective noun for vultures, the word you would use to describe a group of them, is a committee. God, I love the political implications that so many of these collective nouns use. So perhaps one committee of vultures felt threatened up in the skies by a predator and projectile vomited its lamb dinner all over the crouches. Who knows? The vulture theory is the best one we've got, so we'll just say that this particular mystery is solved. Also, and I cannot stress this enough, two guys tasted this mystery meat. Two men willfully ate vulture vomit. So that's it. That's the episode. A flood of molasses that killed 21 people in Boston, and a family who got puked on by a bunch of vultures in Kentucky. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed this shorter double feature episode about the Great Molasses Flood and the Kentucky Meat Shower. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. Stay tuned for my next episode as we dive into the past to uncover the weirdest, grossest, and most mysterious stories in history.